still available at the registration desk. Of course, the APAP staff and volunteers are here to help. Don't hesitate to approach anyone with an Ask Me button or with a staff or volunteer ribbon. And with that, thank you for attending the APAP NYC conference. We wish you an exciting, inspiring, and successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for attending. <laughs> Hi everybody. So um, I hope that you are all awake and ready, and I hope that we are awake and ready. And, um, and in, in my inevitable theater background fashion, I can't stand the fact that you're all here. And this thing is between us, but it is. Yeah. That's all right. We'll make that work. Um, Ooh, one more move one more chair. <laughs> there you go. That's great. So um, so my name is Janet Brown, but first. Uh, and this is our session, in case you wanted to go someplace else, like the plane, are you on the plane too? <laughs> um, but first, I'll let Richard Kessler can introduce himself. This is Richard and I presenting at some other conference. And, um, but he's all those things. Plus, I think <laughs> you should also know he was a touring artist, and talk about that, Richard. Okay, well thank you, Janet, and also good morning. Janet and I are sort of a tag team. Um, sometimes she'll be Edgar Bergen and I'll be Charlie McCarthy, for those of you who uh, know the reference. And other times I'll be Edgar Bergen and she'll be Charlie McCarthy. Um, so for this moment at least, I guess I'm Edgar Bergen. And um, I'm seeing blank faces, so people should go to YouTube and check it out. Um, <laughs> anyway, yes, I'm Richard Kessler. Edgar Bergen's father, you could say that. Yes, he was a big star and he had a dummy. Uh, he was known for his dummy. So uh, ventriloquism, uh, I don't know how much is presented at APAP, but um, <laughs> it is still a living art. So um, yes, I'm Richard Kessler, and I'm the Executive Dean for the College of Performing Arts at the New School, which includes the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music, the New School for Drama, and Manus School of Music, and I'm also the Dean of the Manus School of Music. A long, varied career, not to spend too much time, but um, education advocate, registered lobbyist, I ran two different uh, arts organizations, presenter, um, performing artist, educator. I have um, done a lot of different things as Janet has, and I'm um, really thrilled to be here today to speak, to talk about, and work with all of you together on a subject that's very near and dear um, to my heart. And certainly, um, I will tell you that I'll co present with Janet anytime. So that's my introduction, and now back over to Janet. And also, an artist, as an artist, toured. Right. Toured for many years um, in, in a chapter of my life. Um, actually, um, airplane, but also at a point in time um, in a van with uh, five players. Um, we do six, uh, 40 concerts in eight weeks and drive 16,000 miles. <clears throat> you have to be in your 20s for that kind of tour. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days of um, community concerts. Community Concert Association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's me, same, uh, same picture, but a cuter face from me. So um, I'm, I'm president and CEO of Grantmakers in the Arts, which is um, the very last, last chapter of my life at the moment, um, so far. And, but before that, I was a, a, in theater and a theater manager and worked in New York and lived in New York and toured with, um, worked for Joe Papp and the New York Shakespeare Festival and a couple other European tours and stuff like that. Um, and then we moved back to the Midwest, as you might, might hear from my accent, that I grew up in South Dakota. And, um, and I moved back there to raise my kids and have my own production company, um, and also did uh, some touring with my husband and um, in shows that we did around the Midwest. So interesting, whatever. And then went to higher education, became a dean, and did some stuff there, and then, and then took this job with grant makers in the arts. Um, but my background is also in public policy in the arts uh, and was a lobbyist for about 15 years. So advocacy and matching community arts and, and policy and um, advocacy is one of my passions as it is Richard's as well as arts education. So, um, so hopefully we're going to touch on all of those things today. So there you go. Um, what we want to know now briefly is your name, where you're from, and your organization. <coughs> in that order. Let's start here, Gail. Okay, I'm Gail Halperin. I'm with uh, the Bruce Wood Dance Project in Dallas, Texas. Dallas. <laughs> Alisa Pearson, I'm from Amherst College. I'm an uh, art uh, music presenter there. Tori Weaver Contreras, I work for the Seattle Theater Group, and I'm from Seattle. Yay, me too. Nice. Our offices are in Seattle. 
Dominic Green, Omaha Performing Arts, Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. Fantastic. So I grew up with <laughs> two hours. Okay. Oh, my name is Shelby. I'm with Utah Presents. We're the Performing Arts venue on the University of Utah campus. Becky Way, Texas A&M University, College Station, Texas. Kristen Yanishek, Texas A&M University, College Station. Kaylin Clark, Texas A&M, College Station. Yeah, A&M, yeah, right. here. <laughs> Uh, Sean Albertson, Pace Center, Parker, Colorado. Uh, Angie Beach, Durango, Colorado, Music in the Mountains. Great. Chrissy Smod in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, represent on this small performance. Don't, don't, be, don't, but don't. Don't worry. Don't finish yourself. Stop it. So, who do you represent? Well, I work for a nonprofit real estate development company, and we have partnership with the county, and we are taking, we're redeveloping a performance. <coughs> Fantastic. Egal yep. <laughs> <laughs> Castle, of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. Great. I'm Sharon Dolan from Freight and Salvage in Berkeley. Great. Super. Do you want one? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm Kiki. I'm from the University of Miami. And you're volunteering at the conference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Evelyn Chang. I'm with the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And there's plenty of room. There's two, there three are. chairs right here. They're coming here. <laughs> Nobody needs to stand unless you prefer. And we have more chairs we can put on. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, where are we? Uh, Frank Bradshaw, uh, Weber State in Utah. Fantastic. Uh, Terry Cowan, Davis Arts Council from Layton, Utah. Uh, Victoria Brown, Mashup Contemporary Dance Company from LA. Sarah Rodenhouse, also Mashup Contemporary Dance Company. Super. Rod Thornton, Texas a and University. Great. John Obama, Troy Music Hall, Troy New York. Troy New York. My son used to work in Troy. Cool. Lisa Mount, Artistic Logistics, SWAT team in Coochie, Georgia. My name is Alan Carr. I work at Bates College in Winston, Maine. Great. Derek Wallace, Ithaca College School of Music, Ithaca, New York. I went to Ithaca College. <laughs> <laughs> Kerry Hadley, Camden Opera House, Camden, Maine, a gorgeous, stunning, renovated 500 seat this National Historic Register Theater. <clears throat> Go on that new website. <laughs> My ex-husband went to the fifth in New York. There's always connections everywhere. So it's a very small business. You know, there are only 37 people in the business, and they just move around. That's how it goes. Everybody moves. Yeah. Tara D'Amato. I'm the director of a small group called the Friends of the Arts, and we operate out of Suffolk County, New York. Great. Meryl Budnick, uh, Rose Performing Arts Center at the Wayne YMCA in Wayne, New Jersey. Maddie Gandari, composer and pianist, releasing my new album, Soho, New York City. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Barrett, mom of University Center for the Arts in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Lily Anderson, UAB's Alice Stevens Performing Arts Center in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Mark Elder, I'm with the Lincoln Park Performing Arts Center and Charter School in a little town north of Pittsburgh called Midland, PA. Great. And then we have the live streamers. We do. Streamers, streamers, what? Yes, we're, we're from howround.com. All right. And, uh, cool. I, we didn't hear, what is it? We're from howround.com. We're an um, online community for uh, theater and performance makers. Oh, there you go. Where are you physically based? Based in Emerson College in Boston. Fantastic. We're happy you're here. Was there somebody, did somebody just come in that we didn't get introduced? I'm Nathan, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Fantastic, Nathan. And there are seats again. There's a, there yeah. are at least four yeah. Yeah. seats that yeah. I see. Five, six, five. All right. Thank you. Great group, eclectic group. We hope that you'll be um, involved. What we want to do is have a conversation with you um, about what your community is doing in these three areas. And I'm, I'm sorry, it's like it would pass me by. Um, fantastic to see you again. Uh, relevancy, advocacy and um, audience building and how they connect and what you're doing and what you, what, what you can share with the people in the room, that's what this is all about, um, and what we might be able to share with you, okay? So what we have um, is to talk about these, these three things and then we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions. So relevancy is made by connections, right? And I think that um, in my world of grant makers in the arts, relevancy is, has become, whoa, really the word. Um, they don't say it a lot, I say it a lot. <laughs> but 
but, um, but, but the connections that you're making with your community are um, probably the, 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 the strongest arguments that you have for something. So relevancy. Connections are made by values. So think about um, the values you share, your organization shares with your community and what those intersections might be. And we'll, we're gonna bring these up later and we'll talk about how that works. And then personal and civic concerns. <clears throat> we think there's been a shift, a shift occurring over time. There was once a point in time when presenters, performers might say I make my art. My art has a universal sort of a connection to things. And that um, then you wouldn't necessarily be thinking what are the issues, what are the personal concerns of an audience member, what are the civic concerns of the community. Could those things possibly relate to what we present? Do they relate to the artists? themselves? Do they relate to the presenter as an organization? So many people for a long time said, we don't think so, unless you were really specifically built that way. Janet worked for the public theater a number of years ago. The public theater, as the name would imply, um, was designed to connect to the public. There have always been spaces that were designed that way. But again, we think that we're seeing a shift. And the shift is, rather than organizations looking in, come in meet the artist, listen to the artist, our presentation, and maybe you'll take that and you'll derive meaning and it will influence your life for the better. There's been this way of looking outward and asking the questions of what, what are the concerns of the community? Um, what are the concerns of individuals? How can we meet? How do we connect in a different way? And how do we begin to look outside to the people that surround us? And so we're gonna talk about that as well. Great. <coughs> Okay, so let's think about this. And I'll, I'll make notes and you can do the deal. Um, just give me a word about what, how your community would define you. Not how you define yourself, but how does your community <coughs> define you? I'll have, that's right. Anybody? Yeah, please. Um, well, we recently moved in a new direction, so I think our community, in a lot of ways, is connected to our building, um, our space, not necessarily our program. So it's kind of a strange. So it's a couple of words yes. connected to our building, physical asset. Excellent. Right. Another, please. Forceful. Forceful. Ooh, forceful. Nice. That's good. Like that. Who else? A word or a couple words. I've had that. <laughs> Education. Education. Very good. Again, what do you think? Someone, how would your community define you? In the word. Please. Passionate. Passionate. <coughs> I'm going to be down in August. We're owned by town, and we have incredibly a lot of love for the world. And I think, unfortunately, it's confusing. Okay. Oh, yeah. Not sure, confused, changing. Evolving. Yeah. Evolving. Okay. Evolving. Right. That, I like that better. Okay. Evolving. Please. Relevant and meaningful. Excellent. Relevant and meaningful. A couple of others. Stable. 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 Oh, yeah. That's Good. nice. A secular gathering place. Excellent. A secular a gathering place. Gathering. And I think someone, unless I heard something, said go to, go to, did somebody say? I did go to. Uh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. all right. Go <laughs> That's okay. to yeah. place. Go to the next question. No, um, please. <laughs> Any others? A resource. A resource. Good. A couple of others, and then maybe we'll move on. Let's, who else? Do you want to guess? Those are great. They are great. All right, let's, let's move on now to the second question, and it's assets that you possess 
that you believe as worthy to a broader audience. And this is, again, I think you're thinking, the, the broader audience piece is particularly important and you begin to think of what do you have. You may be using it, you may not be using it. It may be in the area of potential, it may be in the area of aspirational, and it also may be something that you're already doing that's already operational, and, we, and some of it's you know, already embedded in that first question, in the answers to the first question. So what assets do you possess? Funding. Funding? Um, and again, I just want to point out we're looking for the relevance piece, that question of relating. How do you relate? So can I come to you for funding? You can ask me to fund an artist that you're interested in. But if I'm a I can't civic fund. organization, can I come to you and say we're going to do our? Oh yeah. Fund an artist, so is that yeah. No, I'm just I'm just just talking about right. making that connection right, right, right. between, yeah. you know, how, how who you serve and what you do. Yeah. yeah? Please. An affordable venue. Ah. Affordable venue. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Physical asset. Can I ask a question? Um, how many people in the room feel that their space is affordable for the people who live in your community? That's good. That's good. That's good. Do they think it's a? Let me ask that question again. <laughs> how many of you think that your community organizations, your nonprofit organizations, feel that you charge them a fair price yeah. that they can afford in your community? Mm -hmm. Well, it's fantastic. And I think it's reflected in who is using the facility. Yeah, of course. Right. And the relationships that you have with them. <coughs> Excellent. Hey, Another, can you, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. please. Can you, um, can you give me some examples? Sure. Um, we have, um, we're in, okay, I think good example. I'm, I'm in Reading, Pennsylvania. We are uh, the sixth most impoverished city in the country for the size that we are, cities that are of not 80,000 or less. Uh, we're affiliated with a community college. Um, we, we did set, uh, set our rental rates 10 years ago when we opened, but we were, were used by, um, you know, uh, let's see, this month we have uh, Burke's pre-trial pre -trial services coming in because they have a guest speaker. So we've rented to them. We have the, our city use the facility for their inaugural ceremonies, yet we also have um, uh, local arts organizations using it uh, for dance recitals, uh, for um, opera uh, productions. So we, we, we tried, yes, and we're, it's also the size that we are is, is a good size. And are you city owned or is it a nonprofit? Or what we, are, we are quasi government because we are affiliated with the um, community college. Oh, okay. So we're nonprofit, but yeah. Please. A willing and capable and go, go for the broke staff. Uh, Excellent. Go for the willing, capable, and go, go for the broke yeah. staff, which is great. Yeah. Very important asset. Very important. Yes, we'd like to hear that. Please. Identity. Identity. Excellent. Could you give us a little more on that? What do you think the identity is? We started with when our, our small town really had no identity. And they have assumed the idea that they are more cultural and more <coughs> successful because of the number of tourists and visitors that we bring in. I mean, we have helped to shape what our town's identity is becoming. Excellent, and you also believe that you, your connection to a very important, um, a very important part of the maintaining and growing the city, which is bringing in revenue and vitality. More importantly, we're, we're defining the community by the pride of the community in itself. Excellent. Excellent. How, lar how large is your town? <laughs> 10,000 people, so it's not that. It's That's a small amazing. palette to play on, but it, it means yeah. you can do things. It does mean you can do things. Yeah. 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 1.5 million within an hour. They're, yeah. they're our, our client yeah. base. Excellent. That's great. That's great. Uh, outreach and educational outreach. Outreach and educational right. outreach. And that happens because you have staff or because you... More so because of uh, the students that we have. Are you in a college? Yeah. Sorry. Right. Outreach to students. So, so really this asset you have is a student. Right. I mean, we have a staff that kind of 
yes. works that process, but the students are the ones who actually do the outreach. And these terms have taken on, on multiple meanings. Is it in going out and also coming in, both? Yes, we do bring groups in to see our performances, but for instance, our <coughs> recitalists, they can go do their, like, it's good for them as well, they can go do like a pre-recital sure. at one of our um, retirement communities or something out in the community. Mm -hmm. We also do performances on our downtown quad, mm -hmm. and we have a group of students that go play music at hospice care every week. Um, so we have opportunities that we're reaching out, but also people are coming in. And you guys staff that, you organize that. You we, have an, we have one person in our office who does the educational outreach, and she has a student who actually really oversees the whole process. Fantastic, that's fantastic. Please. A passionate student committee? Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. How big? Uh, about 100 students. Okay, and give me a sense of what passion means. Uh, well, we all love the arts, and so um, our job as the student committee is to promote the shows we bring on campus, and then um, the NIDO, we actually work with performances with ushering and taking tickets. <coughs> so all of our students just love what we do, and we keep coming back. Terrific. And tell me, tell me this. Do you see the broader audience do you see an audience broader than um, your students? Yes. Because you're in right? We're located in a, in a community that has sister cities, and so we have um, season ticket holders that come back year after year. Um, and it really reaches the community, too, with our family programs, as well as the uh, Broadway and intimate gatherings we have. Mm -hmm. right. And what keeps the students coming to do this? The, <coughs> the closest um, major city is Houston and that's still like an hour and a half away and our prices are we're closer and they're lower but they're the same um, performances that you could see in Houston or Dallas or San Diego. And is any of that um, subsidized by their activity fees? By their activity tax? No. They have a class. Yes, they have a class. Great, great. We do one other thing that's kind of interesting. We're in the middle of the town of Camden, which is beautiful. I don't know what words to use for it, but we call it a campus. We have major conferences and inter um, international film festival come in, and <coughs> people stay in the area of hotels within walking distance and ends of our opera house and get tickets to the, the restaurants all in our downtown, and we're in the center of the downtown. And so we use it as a very beautiful and different kind of experience than going to a big resort or something. How about one or two more, and then we'll move on to the, the third question. Please. Diverse programming. Excellent. Diverse programming. Sure. One, one more. Please. Uh, we actually have a, a charter school within our Performing Arts Center, so that allows us to uh, pull from a large group of students for performances for all of our outreach uh, for Did our program. Did you say charter school? Charter school. Yeah, yeah, we have about 750 kids in our in our school, and uh, those students are the ones that put on all of our performances. And it's within the Performing Arts Center. Mm -hmm. Excellent, very interesting. That is very interesting. Terrific. You can already see that we actually have started moving on to the third <coughs> question, because we started to look at activities. It's all difficult, I think, to just simply stay with asset, although we have. So the asset has moved naturally into programming. So let's hear a little bit more, and actually, I'll, I'll, let's start with you. So you can give us a sense of the programming and how this works a little bit with the um, charter school within the center. What does it look like? Uh, we normally do a 10-show uh, season. Um, we break that down through dance, music, uh, musical theater, and uh, just uh, straight theater plays. Um, we base a lot of that off of the talent that we see coming up from within and as we grow them so that they we're ready to uh, move on. Uh, last year we did Les Mis with uh, our students and it was actually on par with the Pittsburgh area. In fact, we used the sets from a traveling Broadway uh, performance. Nice it's 7th uh, seventh, seventh through 12th uh, grade. So a lot of our programming is based off of the talent that we have there, but we try to make sure that every student in some way, shape or form either is on our main stage, in our studio theater, in our recording studios. So we have we build everything off of that with what the students uh, need. So if you look think about um, <coughs> identifying, if you could identifying your community needs, not your organizational needs, but where you think, what you think your community concerns are, is that a next question? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> Stop it. It's okay. Slice down. No. <laughs> is it? Is it? I think so. Okay. Okay. Never it's mind. Fine. All right. <laughs> um. Well, I think is what I, I was just trying to think about. What are we? Where do? Where are we making new connections? Right. So is that? Um, what do you think? Can we not go from that question? Because I think that's an excellent question that we just had. That that I never really framed our presenting in these terms, and it's making me really nervous. <laughs> it's really interesting because the thing that I consider all the time is I'm at a college. It's a and our our mission is to educate. Yep. So we provide music mm -hmm. that is educational. It's also fun and awesome. But students, who are my main concern, I have a really wonderful audience that does get personal uh, and celebratory you know, rewards from these performances. They need these performances. But the students don't know yet that they need these performances. So, I, so I'm sort of, I'm, I kind of have this translation issue and I'm speaking gibberish and they're going, what is she saying? I'm going somewhere else. So, so, so we, have, we, have this, we have this kind of veil between us and the students. So, I don't think they see this as their concern yet, but I do. <laughs> well, that can happen so in any class I have yeah. found in teaching, especially when you get the blank stare yeah. from the students. <laughs> but what I would say is, I think actually if we started from what's become sort of tried and true, and it's most appropriate to this day, so just a reminder, today is Martin Luther King Day. And um, many, many organizations have created programming around for many years around Martin Luther King Day. So there will be orchestras that will program a particular piece. There's a Joe Schwantner piece um, that uses the I Have a Dream speech. There's also ways in which organizations have partnered with other organizations to celebrate Martin Luther King, to educate about Martin Luther King. And so that, in some ways, is tried and true. I wanted to be, a, hopefully, we could sort of span out from there. And what it does, and I'll be with you in one second, I promise. You'll be the first one. I think what it does is it connects to what Janet was bringing forward. So it's the idea of starting to create that bridge. What are the concerns of a community? What are, and we talked about earlier, the personal concerns, the civic concerns. You start to think of assets, you start to think of programming. So again, Martin Luther King being the easiest one, but there can be all kinds of things that organizations do, sometimes seeming to be very, very different from what you would ordinarily present. So let's get a little sense of programming that connects to these concerns, and I'm just having given you the most Appropriate uh, example, please. My name is so last. I'm from um, one hundred year. We're collecting a socially conscious hip hop and, uh, activist and artist out of Pittsburgh. And mm -hmm. I would you know, just like to encourage you to connect with the local artists that are in your area because every movement has a soundtrack and the artists are providing it. So if you mm -hmm. connect it with those artists, that'll help you. Um, in terms of our programming, um, I wanted to say that we like to leave a little fluidity in our pro programming. Mm -hmm. So when things happen that are relevant and important to our community, I'll give you an example. Um, when Darren Wilson gets off, the community's in mourning. So we just opened our doors, ordered a whole bunch of food, told everybody to come, and it was almost like a repack. Um, you know, in the community where I come from, a repack is like a party almost, you know? <laughs> and so it was a way that we could facilitate healing for the community. Um, you know, uh, the artists were inspired to create around the subject matter, you know, so that's why I say, like, you know, connect with the people <coughs> on the ground and also leave a little bit of room in your programming so that you can address it without having to go through all of the, you know, political, you know, things that we know that normally have to go through with programming. And viewing, also connecting prior to the assets, viewing the physical asset as being, if, I, if you wouldn't mind my interpretation, as seeing it as part of, as being owned by the community. Because uh, I think that that's an important yeah. twist in, is if you start yeah. to see it not owned by the board or not owned by um, a group that sort of cares for it, but owned by the community or partly owned by the community, it really starts to change the ways in which you think about your work. Mm -hmm. And do you actually um, set money aside for these flexible kind of activities? So, so if you are spontaneously going to invite the community to come, does there, is there a little budget that says, here we can pay for the food and here we can... I do, but I like, I like my bread kind of loosely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 a big chunk for like catering, yeah. you know, things like that. But the thing is, 
when you when you consider yourself part of the community, mm -hmm. the community considers themselves part of your community. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people bought drinks and um, food and things like that. And so it was not a huge, huge yeah. expense. Yeah. And like over a hundred people came, but and they bought children and everything, and everybody was fed mm -hmm. spiritually yeah. and physically. Yeah. Could, yeah, could, yeah. I, could I, could I <laughs> ask her a question? Please, please. <laughs> so we, we are bringing the Campbell Brothers steel, sacred steel string guitars, and we play, we, I have to plan really far ahead. So I'm slow, I'm like the Titanic, I sort of inch along, and, and I, you know, a lot, this uh, funding to bring great artists, and it's, it's a small town, so we, we can bring really great acts. The students just said Amherst Uprising, it was fascinating. They just rocked it. They took over Frost Library, they talked, and mostly uh, white students listened. It was great. And so I talked with one of the leaders of Amherst Uprising, and I said, Campbell Brothers are here as part of MLK celebrations to actually add to that. And um, it turns out we're not the addition, we're the only thing this year, things have fallen apart, so we sort of have the only programming. I said. What, 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 how could you take over ownership of this? Like what, what, how is this helpful to you? And that was the wrong question, I think. Because she came back at me and she said, we'd like to go on stage and do our performance. You know, it had nothing to do, and I, I tried that and I couldn't make that go because there are precedents and we can't do it technically. But I couldn't, I couldn't establish the connection now on the 29th of January. I, I had that date. I had the willingness, I had, I had partners across campus with funding, with, with catering funding, which I don't have. Um, I, I built all that and then it fell down because I couldn't give her what she wanted. How, how, what's the question I should ask? Like, should I not even have programming and just go talk to students? Like, what's the, what would be your advice to me? I don't think it's an either or. I think that this, kind of, this shows you kind of how important it is to make the contacts before the last minute. Well, we talked to the, we talked to the to to the BSU and said you know we're thinking of bringing the Campbell brothers would they be appropriate do you like them and the BSU came and said a uh, uh, black student union and said yes it's a great band bring them. But well, that's a different question. So do you know any local artists that might be or if you all are interested you feel me? So if you have a conversation about being inclusive prior to mm -hmm. then that that will help. But then mm -hmm. there's also a respect with you know there are constraints. So we're a small arts organization, and so we, you know, we do have constraints, budget constraints, and all that type of stuff, right? But um, there are other individuals who, for instance, I, I represent artists, and so my husband is Jasiri X, and so he's a hip hop artist, and people hit me up all the time, like, can he come and perform? But well, we don't have a, a big budget. A lot of times, if you offer people a platform, mm -hmm. and this time I may not be able to accommodate your budget request, but next time I got you, girl, <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes that works. You know what I mean? But it's building those relationships because I'm not, you know, I'm sure they understand that this was like, like a last minute thing. So you just have conversations and keep building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know Maria wants to jump in. Thank you. My name is Maria de Leon. I'm with the National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures, a national service organization for the Latino arts field. And I just want to uh, uh, just add and support to what you were saying uh, that if you want to build connections with community, you have to engage with them all the time. Mm -hmm. And you have to bring them into your programming, into your decisions about what the mission and how you're gonna work uh, as a central part of what you do. You know, it cannot be just about uh, uh, diversity and bringing in, you know, one group or adding one person to your board. It has to be about deep engagement with your community, whether it's the Latino community, African, Asian, whatever community it is, that they need to feel that they have ownership and a voice in the organization, you know. And that will bring in the community and the audience that you want when you build that trust and you build that sense of, of uh, sincere engagement that your organization and your program really reflects uh, them as well, their <laughs> voice as well, that there can be a true uh, interculturality in, in what you do. Uh, and, and that's just, my two cents, you know, adding to what we need to do. I, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit more too about advocacy. Same Absolutely. thing applies, mm -hmm. right? When 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 you want to be an advocate, you don't go to somebody you've never met before to say, "Will you join me?" You go to somebody you've been, had at your table all along to say, "Now it's time, right? We're going to move together." You can't move together if you don't know each other. So this idea of programming is a consistent reaching out to community 
Perfect, Maria, thank you. And, and I think there was a point in time where I was uh, running an organization that brought on a significant amount of arts education advocacy. And in order to do the work, in order to run the campaigns, um, you had to expand well beyond, you had to expand well beyond the issue, the primary issue you were concerned with. So a corollary to this is expanding beyond a particular repertory or um, a very narrow kind of mission. So for, there was a point in time, and it was funny because I was talking about it with my wife very early this morning. About 12 years ago, I remember on Martin Luther King Day, um, um, on a very cold day in New York, going to a rally that was being run by a group of churches and um, a group of organizations, including the United Federation of Teachers in New York. And while the issue wasn't specifically arts education, it was embedded within it. I remember being at this larger rally of people I was getting to know and of people I was becoming comfortable with who had other issues that were sort of connected, but emerging from that were, over the next couple of years, allies. There were people who would show up to our rallies and, I, and we would show up to their rallies and we became part of a larger community when we needed people to sign on to statewide campaigns and we needed to show broad-based support that could never have come to the issue <coughs> if we were only working with the arts education organizations and those solely interested in arts education, but when the teacher unions start signing on, when the charter schools start signing on, when people who are interested in health, women's issues, a whole range of things start signing on, it, it could only have come by us being willing to leave behind what we sort of saw as our tight core foundational interest. And there's something in that shift, the mindset that it requires to, to be able to do that. Which it probably Yep. Okay, so here we are. <laughs> Talking about advocacy. Um, how would your community, right? How would your supporters define you in terms of advocacy? What is it you stand for? Are you defined? Do you have definition? Do you have? Do you feel that you stand for something? This gets back to values. Let's get back to shared values, community shared values. As opposed to service. Mm -hmm. that many may, some of you may feel that you're known by service, providing artistic services. But what values? What, what, what do you project? What do people understand? I mean, as an artist, uh, I would say unity and peace. Well, you know, unifying people. I mean, I have a project called Pianos for Peace, where we put just pianos all over. Yeah, lovely. But that's not organizational. But no, but it's that it doesn't matter because right. it's a human interest. Correct. It's it's Values. something that you're projecting and that you're sharing, and it's not just a piano recital. Correct. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. But, but it's not. Wrong? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Please. I think our community looks at it as. Uh, an advocate for performing arts, and that's what the organization brings to the community that, that they appreciate. And, and we're in a out of the way kind of uh, middle range market, and they would never have it if it were not for the organization bringing in the, the performing arts that they do every year. And, and as somebody else pointed out earlier, uh, when, when the university itself is looking for professors or um, staff people, they look to see what you have. And, it, and if you don't have some version of that, they say, why would I want to come there? Because I enjoy the arts. So I think that's one of the things that I see that, that our organization brings. I, I, I like to break that down. I've decided that sometimes when we talk about arts, People get, what, are they, what does that mean? So what? So what? You're an arts advocate. Does that mean like you're married to a musician and you need the job? That was my life for a very long time. Um, what, what, but what is the value for that? And, you know, and I, I mean, I've, my own definitions have come beauty and truth. I mean, these are the values. You know, artists bring beauty and they bring truth. Sometimes the truth isn't so beautiful, um, but the rest of it is beauty, right? So, I mean, I think that, that when we talk about being an advocate, and an arts advocate, um, what does that mean to people, right? So, um, so I, I love that your community sees you as that. Um, I would, I would, 
expand that conversation to say, what does that mean with your board, with your staff? What, is, what does that mean? So how do you articulate that out into the community, right? Well, yeah, sorry. Can we go back to the, the previous question? Two, to some extent, the way that we do it is we include both the community non-school people and the students at the university in our organization to work on the programming for the future year and, and the current programming. So I, I think including both gets you both views and, and, and you wind up with them feeling ownership both from the community outside the university and within the university. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Ownership. Absolutely. Great. Then we have a hand up. Please. Yeah. Innovation and accept. Now, what, what does that word mean? <laughs> 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 what does that word mean? So, creating new things. And um, Dallas, you know, is. Uh, the stereotype, everything is bigger, <laughs> bigger and better in Dallas. But um, that, you know, is uh, not the case. <laughs> and but <laughs> developing new things, we, we, we want to bring in new people, new ideas, and celebrate these new makings. So in terms of the programming, making new things mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the excitement. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a tremendous opportunity to unpack that. I think that's what Janet was looking for. Mm -hmm. The ways in which, it, you know, if you think through even, you know, planning that you do when you start to get into organizational values and you take a look at what innovation means in many different respects, is it um, to stimulate innovation, artistic innovation, personal innovation? Is it the artists you choose? Um, is it the ways in which, is it the way in which you get behind the art? It is interesting to be able to move from something that's really sort of a meta-oriented term, especially a term that's be unfortunately become a little bit hackneyed, and to be able to find ways to make it live, to animate that term, and how it's not only animated through the programming, but it's animated through the language that you use when you describe the program, when you describe the organization, and it also, in some ways, it can become animated through the structures of the organization. Um, what are the board structures? What are the community structures? What are the friend structures like? Mm -hmm. It can, the, it can, that stuff, that can get pretty interesting if you decide to follow it. And I, I think, I just want to say too that I think the next step of that is, I mean, just like to add on to what Richard said, the next step of that is to say to what end? We're bringing in this innovative new idea, new performance, new artist, new concept, to what end in your community? Mm -hmm. Who is the target audience? What do you want to have come out of that? You want people to be educated? You want them to be inspired? You want to follow up with them? I mean, what, it, what is it? I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just, I don't know. But to what end is it? I'm bringing this artist in. To what end? Is it just because we want to hear a great cellist? Um, and, and, but, but maybe that's not the end. Maybe there is a, you know, then there are cello students then how do we affect them, you know what I mean? So, this, so, that, the, so that we dig a little deeper about what kind, why are we doing the kind of programming we're doing? And how does it have a lasting impact? Or how does it address some of the values or some of the concerns of our community, right? Okay, so let's just refresh on the question. In we have terms like a half an hour left. Okay, good, and we'll refresh. Okay, good, good, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but again, we've, Lunch after this. we've shifted into advocacy. We're trying to shift this into advocacy. So let's, let's focus that a little bit. So I think that we actually could combine a couple of things here. So it would be the question of what is your community, how does your community understand you in terms of advocacy? And then if we couple the other piece, do you believe that there are people in your community that do not get it? on what you're doing or don't feel that it connects to them. And then, it, and then it starts to become a really interesting conversation when you begin to think of who are you connecting to? Who do you feel that there's a sort of pathway of relevancy to and from, a two-way street at least? And where do you feel that that's just not happening? Um, and that gets into audience building, it gets into community building. So those two things, either one, and someone wanna jump in with an audience or community that they don't feel you're you don't feel you're reaching, please. Um, we had a big audience shift a few years ago. Our little, our group called the Friends of the Arts is like quasi-governmental. It was started by a librarian 
who was really into classical music <coughs> at the big suburban library. She got some grant for seed money and she started bringing in performers, mostly classical, because she felt that this economically downtrodden community needed you know, to be uplifted with classical music. And that went on really well for like five, maybe even eight years. And then the concert attendance started really going down. Um, I took over about five years ago and just tried to figure out what was going on. Why don't people want to come? What's going on? And started talking to some of the community <coughs> leaders. And they came to us and they said, well, you know, these are great, you know, but we want, we need something else. Like our school recently cut funding for the school musical, which was really important for this community. A lot of kids got involved. And they asked us flat out, they're like, what can you do? And we're like, oh my god, I have no idea. Like, we could help you, what do you need? They're like, well, can you fund the rights to buy the musical <coughs> performance? And we have volunteers that will produce it. And from there, it grew that our organization started um, partnering with two other arts groups to actually help the students produce the school musical. And now, the whole thing is self-supporting, and it's all run by volunteers, but we also started paying community members who act as producers, um, choreographers, and stuff. So now, we provide income for people in the community who are involved. The families of the students come. We do partner with the school. They, they still, you know, it's mostly students, although we have some adults in the production, but it's been a complete shift from us just scheduling classical music, which is great, but the community wasn't interested, and they had a problem to solve, and we didn't even know how to do it. We're like, I don't know, we'll give you some money. Do you want to try to start solving it? And then that just grew, so that was really exciting. Are you doing any classical music anymore? No, <laughs> no, it, shift, it totally shifted. The community like, really said, you know, we're not interested. We want to do something else. We, we want students involved, you know, we want this type of thing. So it's been interesting. <laughs> this is, and, and I think this is a, um, for, for some, for Dive to the arts presenters um, and older ones like me, um, um, this is a scary thing, right? This is the scary thing. This is, oh my God, I'm going to ask my community what they want and need. They're going to tell me, and then, for God's sake, it's not going to be what I wanted. Yeah, and we've lost one or two. We've lost a couple. We actually lost some board members. Of course you did. Board members. I'm out of here. Forget it. It's not what we do. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> so I signed up. 25 years ago, I was doing a session on rural arts. I, I used to do a rural arts session. But rural and 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 this and there was a guy in the room who said, I've been running this chamber music, and God bless chamber music. I've been running this chamber music. Um, <laughs> Richard serves on the board of the Chamber of Music America. Um, but but this guy said to me, I'm in a small town of Mississippi. We've been doing this concert series for 20 years, 25 years. I can't get more than 50 people to come. 50 people. And I said, you know what? There are 50 people in your community who like chamber music and your audience is not gonna grow right. unless you do something else. So do something else, what's wrong with you? I mean, I, it was like, it doesn't mean, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to stop doing chamber music forever, but it also means that you're not, you're not addressing, you know, you're not addressing what your community really wants or needs, and that's why, well, uh, you know, I mean, we're not there just to educate. We're not there to just say, what's, it, you know, no, let, let me start over there. We, we sometimes have this misperception that we know what the best art is for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that has led us down a sneaky, sneaky, very isolated at this moment path. And if we don't stop thinking that um, and start opening our doors, to, you, you're feeling this. You have to feel this more than I do because I don't run one of your organizations. Um, and unless you have sold out performances, every performance you have, then great for you. Um, but if you don't, there's something missing. And it probably is, what do people really want to see? And how can I really address those, all those concerns? Celebrating in my community, civic concerns in my community, what populations in my community? I want to jump all in. All right, that, okay, all right. I'll we'll jump in with one other thing, just to also tagging on. I think the beauty of the time, and you must be feeling it from the conference or other conferences, is that the range, the, the breadth of work being um, mounted today by artists in all disciplines 
is so much broader and so much wider on an incre increasingly, almost day by day. There are more artists adept in whether it's K-12 or artists who are adept in civic issues, political issues. There are artists adept in creating work together with communities. There are traditional artists, there are technology-based artists, there are multidisciplinary artists, uh, multi-genre artists. So the one, one of the saving graces in this today is it's easier to be able to, you might not have to leave classical music behind in the way we talked about because of the range of artists today who might be doing classical music and music theater at, in a combined way. So that's one of the beauties of being at this conference and one of the beauties of being someone who's working towards finding a way that the art can fulfill a broader mission. You have more to choose from. The material is unlike anything ever before. Um, please. Yeah, I guess I maybe come from the opposite side because my organization is all of this, but without any money, um, and has been for 30 years. Uh, what, I, what is your organization? I run, I run a theater program at AS220 in Providence, Rhode Island, um, which has been around for 30 years, sticking to its guns with an unjuried, uncensored, all ages, all original policy based specifically on community concerns, consistently changing based on like, the needs and wants of the community. But because of that, we've also, um, at this point we have four, four buildings that we own and operate, and because we own and operate them, we're able to like magically skirt by things. But part of our mission is to program everything and anything, so we're built to lose money, to have shows that have five people in an audience, but we don't have enough money to support that in a long-term way, even though it's part of the mission. Um, and so our biggest question is, our biggest like, concerns are how to get more of a financial base, because we are doing all of these things, but we're always scrambling. You know, I run the theater building, I'm the only full-time person, I do 250 shows by myself. So like, um, the, and it is so community-oriented, and we're now also shifting to sp specifically look at communities of color and the communities that properties have become but it takes years in order for those audiences to develop. And I see it developing before my eyes, but I know that it won't completely be there unless there is a time period financially funded for those audiences to build, even if you're doing everything right. Um, oh, I don't that. This is a real issue. I mean, we've been spending a lot of time with Brittany Grant makers in the arts talking about capitalization. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for an organization to be well capitalized? What can funders do to help you? Mm -hmm. um, and what have they done to not help you? Which has been some cultural norms of the past that are we're trying to get over. Um, but but I mean, I, I would have to, what I would, what I, I, if I were a consultant advising you, I would say, stay your course, mm -hmm. and what you need is administrative help. What you need is, is to convince somebody, whether it's an institutional funder, or whether it's a, somebody with some money, to say, if I had two more staff people, if I had one more staff person, mm -hmm. these are the kinds of programs that I could do. So investing in your own organization mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to make, to, to, to continue to make, do the same programming, but to continue to get the word out about that programming so that you can get funded to do it. So oftentimes we don't do that enough. We don't, we don't say, I mean, you wanting 250 programs is crazy. Right? It's crazy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so somehow, you know, that, that yeah. So, some, I mean, so what we're saying is that I don't think, I mean, I think you're on the right track. I think there's money out there to do that. Yeah. You need to not create more programs. You need to create an infrastructure and a stable administrative environment to, to run a business. Right? It's the business. Okay, good. That's good. Please. Um, I'm Nuri with Grand Performances in Los Angeles, and we've been a free summer concert series for over 30 years, and we've lost over a quarter million dollars over the past few years because funders have shifted to this, answering this call, but we are not doing something different because we've been doing it all along. And I, I don't know how you can help us sort of navigate and maybe claim that legacy um, because we're not the, the traditional um, PAC that's now now going and doing community work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can. Well, I, I know it 
very well because I um, part of what I do is I run a, a classical music conservatory. So um, I certainly understand the issue. What happens is, and I think it's connected to so much of what we're talking about for any organization. Things change over time. I think that it's so critical to look at the external world. I have faculty who would like to see the program not change at all, and they believe that the traditional instruction for the last 60 years, is, or the last 160 years, <laughs> is all that's necessary to create uh, an appropriate and effective artist. At the same time, what happens is if you look around the world and you look at what artists are being asked to know and be able to do, what do they need to know in technology? What do they need to know in doing their own recordings, writing their grant proposals, working in communities, um, being effective from the stage in terms of communications, um, multidisciplinary work? What's happened is you run into sort of an interesting moment where you have to, I believe that you have to find ways to evolve, and I think that you can honor traditions, and I think that you can maintain traditions, but at the same time, I think that you have to take a look at the world around you and be willing to innovate from within the tradition, um, maintaining it, but finding ways to change it. And I would also add, I think it's important for, it may be harder for, fun, for presenters, I'm not sure, but I think every organization has to have some experiment. You have to have some place of research and development to try something to let it fail to try a different, maybe it is a big departure. Maybe you create a couple of things that are really extraordinary departures just to see what happens and what it tells you and what you learn from it. And I think that it, in a way what I would argue is all organizations are learning organizations. They have to be learning organizations and you have to be looking at those kinds of loops of doing new things, of assessing, of evaluating and changing. And while it's not the most concrete do X and you'll get Y, in terms of do X and you'll get Y dollars. I think that it's, it's more of a deep-seated issue of assessment, reflection, um, and appropriate change. And it's my best shot at an answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think too, if you're, not, if you're not hooked into a revenue source, like a, a college that budgets for you, which is always nice, if you're raising your own dollars um, and you are having trouble at the moment, you seriously need to rethink what you're doing because times they are changing. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's a um, it's a it's a new world out there with funders, and it's a new world out there with individual supporters. Maybe not this year, maybe not five or seven years from now, but in ten years from now, or fifteen or twenty years from now, um, the donors who were giving to you now are going to be dead, and their children. If they don't care, you, you're out, right? So this idea of relevance, how, do you, well, how are you building community? How are you supporting community? Who's not in your audience? Who needs to be in the audience? Those kinds of questions need to be talked about now with your institution um, before you discover that, uh, oh, oh, everyone's, everyone's <coughs> gone and we're going to go, you know? <laughs> Particularly when it comes to your funders. Yeah. I just want to like tag on to that. I was in a session yesterday about social media and using it for the millennials. Mm -hmm. And they said that by 2018, the millennials will surpass the baby boomers mm -hmm. in their disposable income. So that's how quickly we yeah. have to like switch the world around now. Mm -hmm. um, baby boomers and Gen X are being yeah. replaced. Do we well, actually have, yeah, we, we should move on. Oh my God! Oh, that's okay. Thank you. I mean, I would point out just to think about it in a really concrete way. Um, Comcast today owns NBC, so the the, um, the sort of the you know if you think about it, the cable provider, which used to be minimal, now owns the content provider, the broadcaster. At the same time. I think it's, they're talking about it, something like 30% of people have um, cut the cord and aren't mm -hmm. using cable. So it, that's one, and you know this stuff related, this is not an abstract thing because all these things connect to what we are. It's how people are acquiring um, for, uh, art content to some degree, and it's changing so drastically. So, but if you think about that, it wasn't just the first wave of a Comcast owning NBC, which is only in the last decade, mm -hmm. but now people moving away from Comcast into um, being able to go to um, Netflix or Amazon to see a Golden Globe award-winning show. So again, it can t it, it's not, and it's the pace of change as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
Um, is that is a point that I found? Um, programs or programming I used to in the past have a much broader appeal. I feel like everything nowadays is a niche uh, is a niche audience. Mm -hmm. It's like everyone because there's so many choices. Everyone's almost had to put on blinders and well, I'm a family, so I'm only going to do this, or I'm you know a sports person, so I'm only going to do this. And it's it's just I'm having. Um, challenges just trying to say how I can keep get the community involved as you're saying you flipped it but um, to come well I think if you stick with this we're gonna we're gonna move to the slides we have about 20 minutes yeah. more but what happens is I think we're asserting a, a, an additional twist it's not just the artistic sensibility of I want to choose this artist because this artist performs a certain repertoire but we're talking about this issue of relevance it's enough it, I think it's, it counterbalances in an interesting way. What does the community need? Right. Who are they? How do I partner? It's a, it, it adds another dimension mm -hmm. that may um, leaven that fear to some, or that challenge to some degree. And, and I also want to, I just want to interject this. I'm not sure if it's the right place to put this. But for, <laughs> performing, arts, but for, for, but for performing arts presenters um, in commun with, with, with a venue as an asset, right? Bring your community, convening can come here. Um, we are sometimes um, held back by our, I hate to say this, but it's true, by those people who su support us the most. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Who don't want this to change. The board of directors who doesn't want this to change. Good liberal people who don't want these things <laughs> to happen. Um, and a great case in point is um, the Flynn Performing Arts Center. If you've been, you know, John Clackey used to be on our board. I love John. He's been through the culture wars, God knows how many times. Um, but he he uh, chose to rent the space to Donald Trump, and the supporters in town. Now this is a this is a government-owned facility. Hello, government-owned <laughs> facility. Um, and he got all this crap from. All the, you know, not all, you know, I didn't, shouldn't say, I, I don't want to overblow it. He got some pushback um, from the good arts people who said, how dare you do the, do the, do. And um, this is a community convening space. It is not our job, it isn't his job to tell people in the audience what their political views should be. So his job is to give people access so that they can make a decision. Do you like this kind of music? Do you not like this kind of music? Do you like this political view? Do you not like this? What, but what you know is when you come to this space, you're going to get all of it. And you have to decide, mm -hmm. right? So it's that, um, you know, I, I, we, have to, we have to be very careful because this changeover, this, uh, this ability to say we, weren't, we're, we used to make money here, now we're not making money there, and now we have to change somehow, takes courage and leadership. Hello, the big L word. Leadership. And, um, and that's not always, that's hard. That's you know, hard. You know, the added bonus for um, the Flynn Center was that the marquee has never received this kind of PR. No. Including the fact that Jazz because of Billy Child's name was everywhere. Yeah. 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 Newspapers, yeah. cable TV, it's, it's yeah. incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you know, being at a university and having a very broad mission to just bring the arts to the community, which to us means, um, you know, we have a very diverse community. So we have some of the richest communities in the state, some of the poorest living right next to each other, um, you know, African American, Latino, a very conservative Jewish community, and then our university community, which is a very different audience, mm -hmm. who is our primary funder. How do you become, you know, all things to all people? Because we can't serve everybody, but you know, the, our communities are telling us all this stuff that they want to see. So we're doing the best we can. We have a staff of three and a half people, but it's we just don't have the resources to serve our community. Basically, you know, we can serve a part of it, but not everybody. And you know, our university wants to see very different things than our community wants to see. But our community is the people coming. So sometimes our programming doesn't always serve the community. Well, I'm jumping with one idea. Um, universities will have tend to have a variety of um, people approaches centers. Center, it, they may be social scientists, it may be economists. My guess, my bet is that you, while you, you could never serve an entire university because of the disparate views, however, 
you're almost certainly going to find some people that will probably line up. They may not line up, um, as I said, it might be economics and something you want to present. And you might be surprised that it lines up, but I think that you can find a lot of traction because there's so much offered and there's so many people of diverse practice and interests within the university. So, so I think there's something there to assess and to find the, um, what you think is a good match. I also think, um, I think some of it, even with the stress on the small staff, some of it's just sense making and the right decision making in terms of knowing who you are, what you want to do, how you want to serve the community, and also the limits to it. Um, I think that these things are really important practices to try to make sense of it. And we do like a certain theme every year to try and run people, but then we also see that we get this great energy and then we move to another thing next year and don't really sustain the energy mm -hmm. we had for that one thing. So that's also a challenge. Yeah, and I think that um, I think that what the gal between the little behind you said earlier about the niche 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 audience, mm -hmm. audience business sort of um, sort of shoots out the idea of themes. The community don't have themes anymore. No, the the 10,000 of you are like a lot. <laughs> 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 I would argue that they don't have themes. <laughs> <laughs> I, do think, I do think that um, the, 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 what it comes down to here is one of two things that we have to do. We either have to say, this is our niche and we are there. We are there for these people. And you have to make sure that those people can pay for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to specialize and <coughs> say, this is what we do. Or you have to say, we're going to serve in some, some way or another the entire community because we've opened our doors and we want them to come in. That means this idea of partnerships mm -hmm. and who are you bringing. And I will, I just give great kudos because I worked in a performing arts center in a college and I understand how those ivory walls can be so tall and so thick. Um, anybody who reaches out to community, to community members other than asking them to buy tickets, and, um, and, and hopefully the general age of those who are buying subscriptions is more is under 50, um, <laughs> to actually partner and develop programming and, and to ask people what they want and how they can be involved. How can we serve you? That's the, those, those are the words should be in your vocabulary. And sometimes they'll come up with an answer that you can't do and you just have to be honest and say, oh, well, we can't do that. <laughs> um, but we can do something else. So what's the next idea? You know, and, and, and so I don't don't give up um, be, and because it just takes all of those. You just have to keep all those plates spinning. <coughs> just think of all the plates in your community that you need to keep spinning. And we can do that. We can do that. And, and I'll jump in one last. I, I do think there's some interesting sort of design questions within this to be looking at the arc of a certain period of time. Um, and so even if you throw out the, the themes and the programming, you know that there's always people moving in and out, mm -hmm. but there might be, an, it, it would be, it's interesting, so if, you know, if you're not solely looking at the programming choice, but you're looking at the relevancy and relationship to the community, and perhaps you take a look at a five year clip of what you would like to achieve in the partnership what you would like to achieve in relevancy, in the increasing relevancy, and the deepening of partnerships, it creates, it's a, it's a slightly different lens once you put it up against the programming concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, um, I think that we grow as um, administrators um, in this. So, and I, so I think there's something to that. Again, because it's a different question in relevancy. It's not just which artist. Right. It's, it's so you're, it becomes, a, again, a richer palette to be um, working from. Please, I'm, I'm oh. No, and I, 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 I <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Then, then okay. the I'll back just comment to the theme and then to what you just said real quick. I work at ASU Gamage, I'm a student worker, and I work on our Beyond Residencies program. And yes, we can't serve the entire university, but the artists that we bring in are very diverse to where I'm able to find loopholes to be able to serve the university that we're working with. So <coughs> example is, Meredith Monk is an artist that we have coming in, and her new work is on behalf of nature, and it focuses on ecology. Well, who at the university is doing research around ecology? The School of Sustainability. So I reached out, hey, we have this artist coming in, can we do something? Well, who's an artist, and we want to do something with artists, but we don't know what to do. Well, let's see if we can find the connection between how an artist studies ecology 
and how the people in your department study ecology fail. There's a connection built in a magazine also came out of that. A magazine who never presented artists said, we think this is interesting. We want to promote it. Let's put her in the magazine. So your year may not need to have a theme, but the artists that you're bringing in already have a theme that if you think creatively, you're able to find those loopholes. If you're bringing in artists who used to be veterans, that gets you into the history department. That actually gets you into any department. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every department has a veteran. And what happens is students are like, oh, I heard of Gamma, you guys do Broadway, but I didn't know you used to do these shows. They come, they've never been to the theater ever before, and all of a sudden they're excited because they not only feel connected to the artist who's coming, they feel connected to this big space because we took the time to do our research to find out a way to be able to expose them to something new. You know, if, if you just would have had that talk at the first when we started this, you could be <laughs> <laughs> and this, is ex this is exactly what we're talking about. It's relevancy and finding the, matching the artist with the needs of the community, with the, with the resources in the community, all connected. How do we connect them? So that it takes some more thinking than Geez, I really like that guy. Let's bring him in. What What does that mean? What does it mean to? I mean, what's the next step? And the next step? And the next step? Who does it serve? Who can you partner with? Where does the money come from? And 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 bottom line in this session is that all those things go together. You make those tie-ins that you will. This is where it comes down to the money. You will find the money because the relevancy is there, and your community will see the relevancy in it. We've made this connection with this artist who's coming in from the VA, who's going to do a couple workshops, who's also going to perform, who's also going to you know, go to the hospital, who's also going to do. And this, this makes um, a new audience for you and also brings in, uh, they are your older audiences, but connects to new money. And so that's the whole idea, right? It's not a very, it's not a very complicated idea. It just takes work and it takes, it takes some creative thinking. You can't sit in your desk and just say, oh, here's a date, works for, here's a guy, okay, yeah. done. You know, we can't do that anymore. We have to work harder. <laughs> and I know that you work harder already, believe me, I know, but, um, yeah, you have something. I was gonna say, um, our facility's 10 years old, and I think from the, from the beginning, uh, what we recognized was there needed to be a balance in programming of, um, well, we, we, Open the theater, understanding that we wanted to uh, we wanted to offer a balance of things that we knew would sell, that had artistic integrity, but also to always keep pushing the envelope artistically, and it's it's been a formula that really works for us. So we will we've been able to um, through the years do this um, have this premise, but also to gain the trust of our audience, which I think is really big. Yeah. So if you can pair that up with bringing something like an Arlo Guthrie in next to, you know, 500 Clown, which is physical theater, and have that same audience appreciate it, it takes time to build that audience and then and build it up with maybe um, pre-show talks by the artist so that the audience understands what they're going to see that might be new and then bring them out into the community as well. It, it's a, it's tends to be a really good mix, but it's gaining, it's building that trust in your audience that is, it takes time, it I comes to do. And you're always, so you're always fresh. Yeah. You're always fresh yeah. that way. So I want to see, um, how many of you do more things than bring in the artist to perform? Oh. I mean, I mean more things with that artist, right? So you, have, so you have partnerships yeah. with the schools, you have partnerships, yeah. where are your partnerships? Schools? Libraries, mm -hmm. libraries, 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 schools, communities, social services, yeah. 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 partnerships. Nursing homes, senior centers? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Rotary. 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 Yeah. Library. Library. Yeah. Yeah. Library. Yeah. Okay. Um, Great. I mean, that, we're also, that's, that's also a big part of this, right? Do any of you participate in fundraisers for other organizations? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 How many belong to the Chamber of Commerce? What kind of, so Richard and I, when Richard and I first started talking about this, it's like, what about Performing Arts Center as civic leader, right? Um, and what does that mean? Does that mean going to city council meetings? Does that mean belonging to the Chamber of Commerce? Does that mean belonging to the nonprofit whatever association? I mean, all of those things as a business are important. I mean, I think for too many years, although we're getting so much better, this is great. I'm so old now that for too many years, um, I remember those too many years, we just sat back and said, this is what we do. We've, we have artists, you buy tickets, 
We yeah. open the door, we clean the bathroom, right. you come in, and then, you know, yeah. um, and then you go out and we'll raise money for the next thing. That can't happen anymore. We also we have to think of ourselves as YWCA's, YMCA's. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that kind of programming needs to happen in our buildings. And there's, we've been talking a lot about this operationally, but this slide here, we begin to take a look at the issue of something different. It has to do with the things you know. It has to do with not, if, if you're going to be part of a community, it becomes an interesting question of who leads from within the organization. How do you bring the community concerns in? And how do you help for with, from within your organization model these sorts of things? So there's this interesting question of educating, depending on the institution. Are you, do you know enough about the kinds of concerns of the community to be able to educate your colleagues, to be able to educate a board of directors if you have a board of directors or a board of advisors? A program committee. Program committee, absolutely. What, how do you take the lead in this? It's not enough to just say, the community has concerns, but you, you, what happens is we see people showing up at town council meetings, people who are artistic administrators, who run these organizations. <coughs> they become linked to the concerns of the community, and they become adept at being able to communicate these things, and their understanding helps to influence the operation of the organization. And then there's also this very <coughs> interesting issue Jen and I felt was important uh, for all organizations to consider, is to look at this from a mission perspective. Sometimes people will say it's not our mission. Our mission might have been service. We talk about this, this has come up a number of times. We provide artistic service. But that's not really true. A lot of times when you start to get into the mission of organizations or why they were created, you tend to see that there are educational admission, mission, you tend to see community within the mission. Um, and what happens is you can, you can ask yourself, does this, in the sort of consideration of the foundational meaning of your organization. Is this in it? Is advocacy in it? Um, could advocacy play a role? Now advocacy can mean many things. Advocacy may be, as we heard earlier, the concerns that may be, may be a simple, easy one. The arts and the schools may be um, in danger. Um, is this something you want to support? Maybe something else in the schools is in danger. Maybe some other kind of funding issue. And what are you going to help people understand this? Maybe there's a policy piece that you point out. Maybe it's in a program. But you ask yourself, is this a place where we want to get involved? I think that, I think that both Janet and I would argue, if you're going to be part of the community, it's going to be impossible not to take some sort of stand. It may not be a political stand, per se, but it may be an educational form of advocacy to point out or to make space available. Um, but we think that this is an important thing for organizations um, to get into. Well, and I, I also think the idea of, you know, the environmentalists and, the, I mean, making those kind of connections is our role of advocating for the artists in cross-sector work, right? That's, I mean, that's part of what we do. And that is, a, and, and you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to convince artists of their, that because, you know, as you probably all know, they're there. They're doing this work. And, um, and you can find any, as Richard said, you can find any, any artist to deal with any social issue in your community who will come in and do a fabulous performance and also will teach and also will, you know, speak and also will work with community groups. I mean, it's just astonishing. I think the question artists. there often is like, how do you do that? Like, say you want your professors, you know, you had, you had Meredith Monk first and then you went to your professors or did you do yeah, it the other way around? Not, yeah, it's not easy. I got a lot of no's <laughs> and a lot of not responsive emails and I just kept emailing and I kept calling and I'm like, hey, there's an opportunity here. So, um, and we have a very diverse group. A lot of people don't know who Meredith Monk is if they're not in the artistic world. And I'm a dancer, and I think that some of her stuff is, is weird. But <laughs> she's coming, and we need to build this audience. So it's like, all right, well, well what are we going to do? Not stopping really at no. Just like, no, there's purpose. There's something here. If I can't get it to you, who else in your department can I talk to? So, so you've done what Richard said. Is you've, got, you've, you've sort of said, this is what we want. This is what we've decided. And now we're going to go find partners. Well, our our season is already set, so we are we're changing to be more of a model, which is talking 
which is being talked about here, but this season was already set. So it's like, well, the season set, we have to do something. But what we're doing is also going to play into a part of what we do in our coming seasons where we are making it more community oriented. So which gets back to the issue we talked about before is that you don't ask somebody to partner with you and uh, you, hopefully you have a relationship. Yeah. Just think about the, all the relationships you can create. So we need to, it's time for us to be done, but I wanted you to see this slide. Um, because this is what's happening with the organization I work with. These are institutional funders, foundations, public agencies, state arts councils, um, National Endowment for the Arts, they're all members of Grant Makers in the Arts. Um, the trends are equity, the trends are, as, I, as my good friend Mar Maria Adelio just said to me, I just wanted to, she said, I have to leave you to lunch, but I want to remind everyone that by 2020, um, people under the age of 20 will be, the majority will be people of color. 2020, whoa, what's that? Four years from now, hello. Um, <laughs> yeah, Los Angeles is already the majority majority. So, um, I hate that majority minority, but that's that. <laughs> um, see, this is like getting trouble. Live streaming, bad. Um, okay, so, um, so, so equity, equity has become a huge issue for us. And Grantmakers in the Arts is working um, really, uh, has some really strong language on our website. If you want to go look at our equity, our racial equity and arts philanthropy statement of purpose, um, it is pretty out there and strong. And really, we're really proud of it. The, um, but, but areas of, this is the relevancy issue. Who's not at, who's not in your audience? Know who's in your audience, who's not there? Who are you reaching, who are you not reaching? As a nonprofit organization, which all foundations are, as a government funding, um, uh, as a government funding funder of tax dollars, our concern, their concern has to be that you are addressing the needs of your community because that's how they get their tax exempt status for that purpose. It's not always justifiable in some places that they put their money, but, and, and tax dollars have to go for access. So, or don't, they don't have to. But theoretically, these are the purposes we have these kinds of tax breaks and tax dollars for, uh, for service. And if your organization isn't rising to that occasion, you're gonna miss this boat. And it's a big boat right now. Right, um, and so, and then individual yeah. giving is the same. Um, we, we talked a little bit about this. It's different. Your grand, the, your our grandparents and their parents, um, and or, or our parents, um, gave in a certain way. They wanted to build legacies. They wanted to build major institutions. Um, our our their kids and their kids' kids are not doing that. They want to have impact. They want to be involved. They want to see that what you're doing today. You know, they want to see that you've affected so many kids or so many seniors or so many whatever. Um, and they want to be part of it. They want to be part of the decision making. And they want you to sit down and talk to them about your business, how you're financing it, and how is that, you know, how is that, um, how is their return on investment going to be. Um, so important. And this is our very last thing. No magic answers. Sorry. <laughs> we wish. Um, there are no national benchmarks. I always hate it. I think the worst thing that's happened to the nonprofit arts organization over the last 40 years is that we said, well, yes. in this city they do this and they run like this and they report of directors like this and they raise money like this and so we need to do that too. Uh, you know, the, the best thing I learned about 40 years ago when I was doing community arts development work is that communities are self-determined. You understand what's going on in your town. You understand the economic marketplace for, for the nonprofit business. You have the solutions to these. And don't look at somebody else and say, oh, they're doing that, we can do that too. Because maybe you can't, but you can probably do better for your people. Um, so, consider letting go of the definitions of cultural and performing arts centers of the past, because they are not the future. <coughs> but you all, you all are the future, and you will make it better. So. And don't fear, don't fear the change. change. Take, take advantage of it. Yep. Energize. Go with it. it. It really is. It's an exciting time. It really yeah, is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We're holding good.